right. Well, good morning. Good to see everyone. I know some of you guys got some rain this morning. Uh, we got to hear the thunder, and that was always fun. It's kind of like sitting up in the bleachers uh, for a good show, right? We're just uh, over there on the sidelines, but uh, God's been very gracious to us this summer. We finally got some rain last week, and it was very, very helpful. Uh, one other thing I want to add uh, to Adam's uh, announcements this morning is a uh, vacation Bible school is coming up. Uh, it's coming up at the end of July, and I had it in my head. And July the 23rd, okay, and that's on a Sunday. We're going to start on a Sunday evening. We're going to go through Wednesday, July the 26th. So we're about a month out. So make sure you start looking at your calendars. We are going to be knocking on your door, okay? Uh, we're going to be calling, looking, finding, and asking. Uh, we have all of those little bases. Those of you, many of you have worked VBS before, so it's not a, a new thing for you, but uh, we're going to be needing folks in the kitchen. Uh, I've talked to Rebecca. I know she's going to have to have help, and so I know that's, that's an area that uh, I worry probably least about because you guys do such a great job over there, but we're going to have to have help over there and uh, extra help in, in the kitchen. We're going to have to have folks working with recreation, so if you like to be outside uh, doing those kinds of things, we're going to need folks in recreation. We're going to need uh, team leaders to travel with the kids. We're going to be on the same kind of rotation schedule that we always have been, uh, so we'll need folks uh, be moving around with the kids. We will need some volunteers who like to work with littles. Okay, because we take the littles, keep them in one location, and they stay there the whole time. So we're going to need some folks to volunteer with littles. Uh, Steve will be uh, needing a little help in here uh, doing the music. Uh, we're going to need some folks to do uh, crafts. Okay, so all of those areas. And we're also going to need folks to help decorate and take down. Uh, so we've got some ideas. We're working on that right now on what all we're going to put here on the stage and how we're going to decorate the church. And uh, So it's going to be a great VBS. Looking forward to it. We're about a month out. And so you're going to be hearing a lot more about that uh, in the days to come and asking for much, much help. So if you have that time off, if you're not on vacation, if you're going to be around, uh, we'd love for you to mark your calendar off and just be here. If nothing else, uh, probably the most important thing that you can do for our VBS is to pray. Uh, because here's the thing, you know, I was, he, he, all the details sometimes overwhelm us in VBS. And, and I was talking to my good buddy, Troy, as I do a lot and, and yesterday, and he reminded me, he said, you know, Jesus will still show up. And he said, don't let the devil get in the details uh, because we see more young people come to Christ during that time than we do. So let's not forget that. That's the reason why we're doing it. And so it's not all about all the little details. It's all about sharing that message. And we carry that spirit with us. So us just being here and having a good attitude, because uh, I'm just going to tell you, <laughs> I'm probably not going to do everything that the Moors did when it comes to decoration. Okay, So don't walk in here and go, well, Erica did this, because I'm just going to bring Erica with me if I have to, and then she can chastise you. So be, be in prayer for our children. Children, we're going to have a good time. All right. We are going to have fun. I got some pretty cool ideas that we're going to do because uh, I was making volcanoes uh, 30 years ago uh, in churches and making them go off. And, and, and heck, we've got our rocket man over here. Uh, Bill Wilson is with us this morning, and that dude built a rocket on this stage that reached all the way to the top. And so uh, we can do some cool things, and we're going to do some neat things with our uh, It's Ready, Set, Go. Uh, so we're going to do some really neat things uh, for VBS, and so we're ready to, uh, to make that happen. So we appreciate, I appreciate so much, I tease a little bit, but I do appreciate what the Moors did in helping us organize the structure and how that flows. And we're going to continue to use those great ideas. We probably just won't build all the little things with all the little details in it. But, uh, but the structure will be the same, uh, the movement will be the same, and the message of, cer of certainly will be the same. So the other part of that is, is go out and find some more kids to come. Uh, who may not know who Jesus is, who may have a family who doesn't go to church, invite, 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 uh, get those dates down. Uh, we'll get those uh, advertised. We'll get those on our Facebook page. And let's make this, VBS is our largest evangelistic outreach that we do all year here at Living Faith. And so it's true. And, and, and so we have more people on campus. Last year we had over 200 people on campus every night including all of our volunteers and our kids. So it's a big week, and we're going to have a lot of fun, okay? Uh, so coming up uh, over the next month, a lot of things will be uh, talked about and things we're going to be doing. This morning, we're going to hit some curveballs, okay? Because if you've been reading through the life of the F-260 Bible reading plan, you've come across Daniel this week. We're going to take a few weeks and camp out with Daniel. Uh, we've, been, we've been here before, but the, there's a little different approach that I want to look at this morning uh, when we, uh, we see this. You know, we like order. That's just what we do. And so do cows. Uh, my cows like order. Uh, you know, when you really think about it, a 1,200 to a 2,000-pound animal can go through most fences that we build. They just choose not to. 
if we provide the needs, I was talking to Don a kid about this yesterday, if we provide food, if we provide the needs that they have, a place for shelter when they need it, a place to eat, uh, water to drink, and we kind of get them accustomed to where they are, they just kind of do their own thing. Uh, they hardly ever go test the fence. Uh, they'll just stay and do what they do. But if we have to do something to change that, it creates chaos. And I had to go out into the field on Friday, and we had to move six cows from two different pastures to a holding pen. And everybody had been just fine. I mean, they just, I didn't even really look. Three of them, I, didn't even, I haven't even hardly seen. They've just been in this one field for the whole summer. And I just go over and check their water tanks and make sure they've got water. And then they just do their thing. But Friday, we had to get them up and get them in a trailer and move them and take them where we go. And so we created a lot of chaos. And there was all kinds of noise and everything else. And, and, and in one field, I pulled three cows out and I put them in the holding pen. And I left the bull over there by himself. And I should have known better. But anyway, a little later on, I'm driving through the yard. And, and the bull passes me in the yard. He's like, you see my girls? I lost my girls. I don't know where my girls are. So he just broke the gate and he come on out. So we had to deal with him. And so when we do things that create chaos, <laughs> it, it has a real impact on us. Okay. Now, Daniel was growing up in the kingdom of Judah. He grew up in the Southern kingdom and he grew up in that land. And, and in that place, in that world that he lived in, he grew up in a world of order even though there was lots of sin, even though there was lots of disobedience among the people, Daniel grew up in a, in a world of war until King Nebuchadnezzar sent his people to lay siege to the city. Now, when I think about uh, a, a young person, Daniel was probably about 14. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain a little more about, about that here in just a minute while we think he was probably about 14 years old when this happened. But, but when, you, when you realize what took place, um, Daniel getting the call from the back. Uh, say, when, when you think about what, what, who Daniel is and, and, and where he's at, he's only 14 years old. One thing I think we can look at in this, in this setting is that Ukraine, okay? That's a world that we're living in at this time. And, uh, and, and, and you take the kids who grew up in the Ukraine over the last 14 years, and all of a sudden Russia has invaded their homeland. All of a sudden, Russia has invaded. They've come in, and, and, they, and, they, and, they've, and they've laid siege. And so when, if, you, if you follow any of those folks' story, if you follow any of the things that they've been through, you see just how complicated uh, that has created in their life, how many crazy things have happened in their life. And, and so they've had to overcome that. And, and it's been something that has, has caused a, a great, great deal of strife. C Coleman, did you leave your phone up here? Oh, really? Oh, there it is. So, if you can imagine those children growing up in a, in a homeland where everything was pretty normal, they go to school, they do the things, they go. To, uh, I follow this uh, the, uh, this young lady on Twitter who who gives a, she kind of is giving a um, a blog of her life in Kiev uh, during the invasion of Russia. And so I, I, I follow her. On, and, and, and so in, in the midst of the bombing, and, the, and we saw the same thing back in World War II in England and, and all these other places, that, that even though things are happening that's causing great disruption, they make an attempt to live normally. And so, you know, she'll, she calls, uh, she'll, she'll go out into the market and uh, she'll have a cup of coffee. She'll go into a coffee shop and, you know, and she'll be talking about the air raid sirens that are going off and people are sitting around having coffee and you're sitting there going, such a different world than what we live in and we don't really realize how blessed we are. And, and going into the marketplace and people are out with their, you know, I, I think about folks that go to the farmer's market and sit up at our farmer's market and we're selling the, and, and, and you guys don't have to worry about getting bombed, <laughs> okay? And, and so she shows videos of people that have their table set up and they have their food set up that they've grown and and you know they're always looking to see if a if a if a drone is coming or an air raid you know and, and so the life that they live and, and so you can kind of put that and equate that a little bit to Daniel's life growing up it, it, when this happened when these when these invaders came and took over uh, this this land and and the thing about with Daniel is he was kind of plucked from his life okay he was just kind of taken as a 14 year old He's taken away. And so just to kind of set the basis for what kind of chaos uh, this is like. And so this is the thing. When we go through our routines, when we do the things that we do and all of a sudden something doesn't work right, it's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, life is throwing me a curveball. I thought, you know, what it was going to be it was not what it was going to be. And, and now here it is. 
And, and it happens to all of us. And it, and it happened to Daniel. So we wanted to pick it up here, Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, and, and talk about what's happening. And so verse 1 kind of sets the, the time frame. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Okay? And so that what we were just talking about, that's a good way to kind of put yourself in the perspective of what's happening in his life when a, when a foreign invader comes in and sets siege to the land that you're living. It's violent. Things are destroyed. People are assaulted. People are killed. An event like this is going to affect anybody who goes through it. Anybody that witnesses anything like this is going to have an adverse effect on them for the rest of their life. Verse 2 says, And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. That's for another story for another time. We'll come back to that. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put them in the treasure house of his God. That comes up later. So not only do we have the trauma of this situation, we also have the spiritual aspect of, of witnessing God's temple being defiled. And, and all of these things, it, it's a powerful display of blasphemy by Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel has to witness all of this. He has to see all of these things because as we find, Daniel was raised in that world. He was raised in the world of leadership uh, and he was one who, who had been educated. He was one who had been schooled. He, he was one who had been trained. And so there's a lot of good things about Daniel that he had done. And so he was one that they sought after. And so now we see in verse 3 that it becomes personal for Daniel. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Just a note here, when you look at some of the other translations, what you find here is not only was this the chief of the court officials, he was also, he was referred to in other versions as the chief eunuch, okay? And so if you don't know what that is, uh, it's like the steer of a human, okay? And, and so a lot of folks and a lot of scholars, and this is really not, but, but, but I want to just kind of leave this as a program note because a lot of folks do believe that that also when Daniel and, and Shadrach, Meshach, when they were brought into the king's service, that that happened to them as well that they were made eunuchs uh, because they were coming into the king's And so they did that in order to get them to be disciplined and to only focus on what was going on. And, not, and so whether that happened or not, I can't say. Is it likely? Very much so. Okay, and there would be no reason for them not to. And so to be brought into this, the king's service, uh, then that would be something that they, that they would do. And, and, and so you think about <laughs> the trauma, okay, you think about how that is, and everything that he's having to, to go through, and then all of a sudden you're brought into this, to this area of, of servanthood, and so they wouldn't, it wouldn't be a, such a big deal, but it's like, this is, this, is, this is what happens. He was to teach them the language. Notice this. These guys were well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Okay. So they were going to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. Now, the Babylon, Bab, Babylon's been around for a while. We go back into Genesis and we, we learned about the Tower of Babel. Okay, it, It's the same geographical thing. It's the same people. Another term that they refer to uh, the Babylonians is, a, is the Chaldeans. That is a uh, more ancient term. And so the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Now, think about this. You got, you got some young men here who have been raised as Jews. They've been raised to love God. They've been raised to worship God. They're 14 years old, okay? And they're pulled from their life, okay, and in and, and, and many accounts that their life was radically changed, and now they're exposed to all of the pagan culture that you can imagine. Okay? The language, the literature, everything. And so they're bombarded with this. Now, 
just, just kind of hold on to that for just a moment and think about how, 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 how many 14-year-olds do you know that would cling to their faith in God after everything that they know has been torn apart? And now they're exposed to all of this culture and all of this food and, and all of these things that they have at their fingertips. A 14-year-old. Now, there's a lot of details that the Bible doesn't give us, but this is the thing. Besides being goofy, okay, I've, I've had 14-year-olds in class for 30, 31 years, okay? And so, besides being goofy, uh, that's, what, that's how you, it's kind of how I describe freshmen, okay? But they're very impressionable, okay? They're very impressionable. It's when they, they latch on to things. Okay, when I when I have a when I have a student who who wants to uh, become a, an FFA uh, uh, officer, or they want to become uh, something in FFA, and they want to when they're 14 years old, you have some of those kids who will come and they're just like, I want to know more. I want to go everywhere. I want to do everything. I want to I want to compete in all the competitions. I want to be that you know. I want to do all these things, and so they're impressionable. So they may have never heard of any of these things before, but they're like, hey, I want to latch on. And so you can imagine that these young men are being brought in from, from, from Israel. They're brought in from Jerusalem, and they're brought in to this environment. And that's all of a sudden, it's like, okay. And, and you would think every possibility would exist that they would go, okay, we'll just embrace this culture. We're just going to embrace this culture. We're just going to dive right in. They're very, very impressionable at that age. Now, this is the next thing that happens in verse 6. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah. Okay, and then we get these names. We have Daniel, we have Hananiah, we have Mishael, and we have Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. Okay? To Daniel, the name Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. Now, without breaking all of those names down, let me help you understand. All of those names were about giving pride and giving um, homage and giving allegiance to the gods of the Babylonians. Belshazzar that was given to Daniel was the uh, was Baal. Okay. That's why he was named that. And so not only now have they taken them, they've changed their names. Okay, They've changed their names and they've given them names. Each one of these names is uplifting to one of the Babylonian gods. Now, <laughs> here they are. Now, these guys are out there. And, here, and here's the thing that we need to kind of... How do, how, do we, how do we start applying this to our own lives? How do we look at our own teenagers? How do we do these things? You know, I, listen... Our kids are in the world, okay? Your kids are in the world. Now, they're not supposed to be of the world, but they're in it, okay? And so this is why things are important. It's very important for a 14-year-old, and what we have in our culture is they may be exposed to, you don't know what in the world they're exposed to, and, and there's unbelievable things that they can find here, but they need a place to be grounded. And, and that's why we have a youth pastor, and that's why we have a youth group, and, and they have that to be able to check in. Okay, they have a place where they can connect to God. They have a place where they can connect to a, a pastor. They have a, a way to connect to their roots. They have a way to connect to things. These guys had none of this. They're pulled. Their names are changed. And here they are. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? So what we see happen next brings us to question. How did this even happen? How did this even happen? Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Now, they've been given all of this food, and, and this is what Daniel does. Notice, it's a third word here. Daniel resolved. But Daniel resolved. I, I, I sat there this week and just looked at that word, and, and I'm thinking, you know, about a, about a great leader in our church or a great leader in our, uh, in our world, people that we, that we think about. I, you know, I think about a Billy Graham or I, I think about a, a Adrian Rogers, and I think, you know, that guy says he, he resolved that he is not going to do that. And then I'm thinking, he was 14. 
This kid was, this kid was 14 years old. And, and when, I, when I just let the weight of that just kind of fall down on me, I was like, this is, this is amazing. It's amazing. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now, God had caused, here's the thing, that we never count out what God can do. Okay, When, when we have decided that we're going to be faithful, when we have decided, when we have resolved that we're going to do things the right way, Never in your mind allow yourself to go down this road because this is what Satan's going to do. Oh, if you go ask to do that, they're going to shoot you down. They're going to say no. That's not going to happen. But this is what we can't ever count out because God himself, (laughs) okay? God himself had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. God got involved. You say, well, why didn't he get involved? Well, he allows a lot of things to happen. He allowed this to happen. He allowed, and, and, and you know what? Here's another thing that we, we get frustrated with our world, and we're like, you know, this whole world's getting in a bad shape. Okay. Well, God had been patient with these people for 500 years. Folks, we haven't even been here 500 years on this, on this, in this United States. God had been patient with them for 500 years before he finally said enough is enough. But in the midst of all that, we have a Daniel. We have, a, we have the faithfulness of a Daniel even in the midst of such disobedience. The official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord the King. I'm afraid of my Lord the King who has assigned you food and drink. Okay, old boy. I mean, you're only 14, Daniel. <laughs> but I know what he's capable of. I know what he's capable of, and I know what he could possibly do. I am afraid. I am afraid of my Lord the King. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? He's going to know. The king would then have my head because of you. You see that? See, I've seen this before. I've seen this before. When I don't follow king's orders, okay, I've seen what happens to other people when they don't follow orders then he puts their head on a plate. Next, this is the way of this culture. You will do as I say. If not, then we'll just stack you over here and move on to the next person. And so you feel the weight of, 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 of what, what the chief uh, eunuch is having to do here by going, Whew. you know, but you all know the thing. <laughs> you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Okay, this is the day before IVs, so they can't make Daniel eat the food, and he kind of knows that, and it's like, well, okay, so what are we going to do? And he said, you know, if you don't eat, you're not going to look good. If you don't eat, you're not going to have energy. If you don't eat, you're not going to be able to do what you're supposed to do. And on Daniel's part, this is what we have to understand. We, as followers of Christ, have to pre-decide that we're going to be obedient to God's Word. If we haven't made that decision when, th- when things are going well, what's going to happen when we get confronted with evil? What's going to happen when we get confronted with the temptation? What's going to happen when the testing comes? If we haven't pre-decided that we're going to be faithful when times get tough, then we'll fold up. Daniel had pre-decided that he was not going to do this. It was like, you know, there's some things that we'll go with. You know, and, and there's a lot of things here. I mean, you would think, well, he would kind of maybe balk at the name change. I mean, he never refers to himself as that. But he's in their culture, and there's some things that we just have to live with. Call me whatever you want to call me. I know what my name is. We can only imagine the temptations and the fears that they faced when they found themselves living in this pagan culture with strange gods, strange traditions, strange practices. I mean, so it was just had to be so easy. It would have been so easy for all of these circumstances for them to just fall into despair, fall into hopelessness. And any number of sinful practices could have come from this. But instead, Daniel said, I am going to obey God's commands. He recognized when he was faced with temptations and threats that would lead him into behavior unpleasing to God. And he determined in advance... I'm not going to let this happen. I'm not going to let this happen. I'm not going to do this. There is a line. There is a line. And for him, it was the food. 
because this is personal. Okay, you can call me Belshazzar. You can call me whatever you want to call me. I know what God named me, and I can't. I can't control you. Okay, and so I can't control you, and I can't tell you what you can call me because you can do whatever you. That's on you. Whatever you call me is on you. But what I put in my mouth is on me. This is my decision. And, and here's the thing. There was certain unclean me. The, the, the things that they were offering were not kosher. And, and I think maybe even more so than, the, than that was that he was very aware that, that some of this food had been offered to idols and that was strictly, strictly forbidden. And, and here's the thing for us. This is what we have to take here. Life is filled with situations that test our resolve all the time. When, t- when temptations come our way, it causes us to stray from God's commands. And, and, and it puts pressure that will compel us to compromise to the world standard. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. But, but here's the thing that we have that Daniel didn't. Okay, Here's the thing that was not in Daniel's time. And I believe that God was with Daniel. Don't get me wrong. But when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, God gives us His Holy Spirit to empower us. Okay, And so I think that same Holy Spirit was who was, was, was directing the chief eunuch even when he had no idea. He had no idea where it was coming from when he was like, oh, well, maybe I better let you. That was God. And that same Spirit lives in us and helps us to stand against those pressures and temptations. But we have to be resolved to act in obedience. We have to choose to be faithful. That comes from us. We have to choose to listen. (laughs) The time to make a firm resolution to walk in God's ways and set one's heart resolutely to obey the Lord is before the time of temptation comes. Daniel chapter 1 verse 11 says, Daniel then said to the guard whom the uh, chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, just test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables and, and to eat and water to drink, and then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food. Treat your servants in accordance with what you see. I'll give you that. You let us do what God's called us to do, and then you look and see how it works. So he agreed and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Lo and behold, how about that? So the guard took away their choice food and wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Daniel was faithful. God came through. You know, in our life and in our world and the things that we do, we have to understand that we have to submit to human authority. We just do. It's commanded of us. It's what we're supposed to do. Daniel was in a difficult situation. He was in a tight spot. The Lord had commanded him to abstain from certain types of meat that were considered unclean and to refrain from eating anything that had been offered as a sacrifice to a pagan idol. He understood that. At 14 years old, he understood that. But now he's in Babylon. Now he's not in his home. He's with a foreign king. And he found himself faced with a steady diet that included both types of forbidden food and he had been commanded by the king himself to eat those foods. You see where he's at? So he, he seemed to be forced to choose to either obey God but disobey the king or follow the king's orders but do what God and the law had commanded him not to do. But what Daniel found was a third option. And many times God allows us that third option. Because here's the thing that the Bible talks about temptation. We get it all confused a lot of times and think about it. God won't give me more than, God, God won't allow me to be, uh, put more on me than I can take. That's not what it says at all. But what it says is that he won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. And he always gives us a way out. He always gives us a way out. And, and that's New Testament, but here we see it applied in the Old. Because Daniel's like, uh oh. I'm in a place where I don't know what to do. I'm not supposed to eat this food. I know I'm not supposed to eat this food. So I'm going to ask to get out of it. I've got to follow the king's orders. And so you see where he was at? It was like, if I, if I do what God says, then I've got to disobey the king. 
and, and if I do what the king says, then I'm disobeying God. So what did he do? <laughs> he asked the king, can I get out of this? Can I do what I'm supposed to do? Now, he didn't get to talk to, to Nebuchadnezzar, but indirectly, he was like, let's try a third option. Let's try a third plan. So Daniel found a way to submit himself to the king's authority while still obeying God's commands. See how that happened? Just give me 10 days. See how it works. It worked. God does this all the time. See, what underlay in this was a genuine respect for human authority. Did you see how he did that? He didn't stand up and say, I will not eat this food. I cannot eat this food. This food defiles my God, and your God is, 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 a, is a fake, and it's a liar. And, and he didn't do that. He said, hmm, well, you know, I'm really not supposed to eat this food. I'd really rather not. I'd really rather have vegetables. Well, if you do that, you're just going to be sick and weakly. Hey, give me, can you give me 10? Can you just give me 10 days? Let me eat it for a while. And, you, and then you, you, you look and see what you see. He, just, he didn't defy the king. He just asked permission from the king. And he was like, okay, we'll give you a shot. And it worked. His motive was to be able to obey both king and God. Not to rebel against human authority. You see, God commands us to submit to both him and our earthly authorities. Okay? And, and if you try to defy that, you can just, you know, you can drive down the road at 100 miles an hour. And, and if you get pulled over and you look at the state trooper and say, hey, God told me I should go this fast, see how that works out for you. Okay? All right? That, that's the end of your day's driving. I guarantee it. Okay? You won't, be, you won't be driving anymore today. This is the thing. God commands us to submit to both him and our earthly authorities. And in most cases, it's possible to do both at the same time. And that's how we're to live our lives. Now, it's not always the case. Keep reading Daniel. <laughs> okay? You just keep reading Daniel, and eventually there becomes a line in the sand. Eventually there comes a place where it's like, I guess I'm going to get eaten. Okay? I guess this is the end. Because I, there's lines I can't cross. There's things I can't do. And when I get to this point, then it's going to be God, and we'll see how he shows up. And he typically shows up in amazing ways. But not always like that. Okay? I'm reading a book right now. It's called, I, I'm, I'm reading a 40-day devotional um, on the voice of the martyrs. And listen, sometimes God calls us home. Sometimes he says, look, that's it. It happens all the time all over the world. There comes a time when God says, look, you're gonna, I want you to stand for me. And then you resolve, I'm going to stand for you. I'm going to stand for you. And you come to that place, and it's like, okay, this is, life, this is life or death. This is the end. What will you choose? It's not easy. Most of us are not called to make that choice. Most of us are not called to, to, to come to that place to say, look, I'm going to choose God, and that means the end of my life here on this earth at this moment. It's it. It's over. I'm on, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way home to be with him. Why would he do that? Listen. <laughs> Many times including our own Savior, okay? It's our deaths that speak the most. It's the resolve. It's the resolve to be able to give our lives. With Christ, he was like, look, I'm, I'm going to give my life. I'm going to give my life for you. And because he did, and because he rose from the dead, he overcame the grave. And, and, and so I listened to that song coming in this morning. Ain't no grave going to hold me. And so if it comes down to the point where I have to choose him over the world, I'm going to choose him. If that's the end of my life here, then so be it. I've got eternity to go. And so he's already promised me that. And so I don't know when he's going to call me to do that. I don't know. I don't know. But when it's time, it's time. Are you at that place? Are you at that place? Whatever culture or authority that we find ourselves under, he wants us to submit to it to a point. In all settings, we're to obey society's laws, follow company policies, submit ourselves willingly to those whom the Lord has placed in authority. Paul reminds us, Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. 
And God appoints the authorities that exist. Get frustrated with who's in authority? They are only there because God allowed that. Remember that. Always remember that. There's no one that's in any position of any authority anywhere from your, from your office boss to, your, to the person that you work for to the superintendent of our schools to the superintendent of, of anything to the president of the United States. Nobody. God did not sit there and go, oh, man, I was trying to keep them from getting elected, but I just couldn't. Oh, gosh. What kind of God do you serve? Okay. I, saw, I serve the God who put the stars in place. So anything that happens is, is, is he allowed it. Okay. And Nebuchadnezzar came and besieged that city and took those kids, and God allowed that to happen too. If he was not going to allow it, they would have never even woke up that day. None of them. That's the power of the God that I serve. And so when it happens, it happens. And so when, when it's there, we just have to say, okay, how do we exist in the midst of this chaos? How do we exist in the midst of this crazy Whenever we face trials, whenever we face temptation, whenever we go through those things, we have to always remember that God allowed it to happen, but he is still very much in control. He is still very much in control. When that guy who was, who was who, think about that. How many times would, would your head, it's like, he's going to cut my head off. If you've ever had to face even, we don't have to deal with that in America, Okay. To be actually get up in the morning and go, okay, I'm going to make some decisions today. And if I make some wrong decisions, then somebody's going to take a blade and remove my head from my body. Okay? That is not a problem that we face. But that was this guy. That was his problem. If I do this wrong, then somebody's going to remove my head from my body. Now, I'm going to tell you, that is a motivator, a powerful motivator. And so when Daniel said, I don't really don't want to eat this food, he's like, mm, oh, yeah, you're going to eat this food. I'll stuff it down your throat because I'm not losing my head today. So God had to be involved for him to go, okay, I'm going to risk my literal head for you. Okay? That's crazy. It's crazy that God could compel him to go, you know, you're worth my head. We're going to try this. That's how powerful God is. It's like, okay, okay, we'll give it a shot. We'll give it a shot. We have to pre-decide to obey God's word. Tough times, difficult times, and is not a time to go off the rails because God doesn't care or this wouldn't happen. It's absolutely the wrong thing to do. And we must peacefully submit and work with our authorities. We as Christians always have to be seen as helping our neighbor. We've got to prepare our kids. Would your kid do that? Are you raising a Daniel? Think about that. Are you raising a Daniel? If you're, if you're a parent or a grandparent, are you raising a Daniel? How will they handle pressure? How do you respond to those things that come our way? I guess the final question is this. Does your response give honor to God? It begins with Christ. It begins with a relationship with him. Because if his spirit is not inside of you, then you can't, get any, you can't get through any trial. You can't overcome a temptation. And you sure can't lead young people in that direction. So if you're here today and you don't have him, don't leave without him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for Daniel. I thank you for um, his faithfulness. I thank you, Father, that he chose to obey you before things got tough. Father, help us to choose to obey you. Father, today our life may be smooth. Everything may be rolling along good. Help us to say yes to you. Help us say, to say yes to obeying you. Father, you know where we are. Maybe there's someone here today that's facing a very difficult life trial. Maybe they're going through a very tough testing time. It's very easy to fold up. It's very easy to lose faith. Father, they need to be reminded, and maybe they've been reminded today, that you're very much still on the throne. You're very much still in control. Father, help us to look to you. Father, help us to respond and reflect in the way you've called us. We ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Please stand.